Calling All Explorers is a podcast from the Harvard Innovation Laboratory in Boston. Your hosts are Harvard Business School alumnus Ronald Terrazas and me, Harvard junior Jessica Pizzolides. Along with Dr. Gordon Chu, we are co-founders of iLab member Fingra, a for-profit public benefit corporation dedicated to discovery, development and commercialization of materials that can transform humanity's ideas of sustainability and ecology. Dr. Chu is our regular guest. He is a globally recognized scientist who is author or co-author of 41 international patents, many dealing with the wonder material graphene. He is a distinguished alumnus of Harvard Business Analytics Program and of Wharton's Advanced Management Program. Hi, Dr. Chu. Hi, Jesse. How are you? Very, very well. How are you? I'm good. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you too. Um, so last time um, we were talking and we kind of sowed the seeds to discuss um, applications of graphene in horticulture and food cultivation. And I want to talk a little bit more about that today. Um, so we had kind of shared some information um, over the last couple of weeks discussing um, the food crisis that we're facing today and some of the most alarming elements of it, including young onset rect- rectal cancer. And I was wondering, Dr. Chu, if you'd like to talk a little bit about this and introduce the issue? Yeah, so um, you know, colorectal rectal cancer has always been something that um, plagues us uh, as we get older. Um, that's why the uh, uh, the screening age, um, uh, you know, as you hit the uh, 50 and, and upwards or late 40s, you start screening for this. But seeing it show up as early in the, in, in the early 20s mm. is a very unusual uh, circumstance and it's yeah. been plaguing uh, many many um, researchers as well as uh, uh, frontline physicians when it comes to um, you know, what is going on mm-hmm. right and I you know you know I've known each other for some time now but we've yeah. never sat down to have a meal that's right uh, that's right right <laughs> at, at, at whether it was in Cambridge or, or or when you're here when you were here in New York we didn't get a chance to sit down so I don't know what what it is that you eat. Um, Mm -hmm. um, Can you tell me what you eat for um, like any meal? Like, do you eat, uh, do you, do you, you, (laughs) what do you like to eat? um, Well, I'm Greek. So um, I've Mm. been raised on a pretty Mediterranean diet, which is lots of veggies, Mm. lots of fruit, lots of fish and chicken. So I'd say, Mm. I'd say pretty balanced. (laughs) Yeah. So, so thank you for sharing that. I, the, now I know that you eat meat and, um, and, uh, and I also eat meat. I'm an omnivore. So I eat meat and I try to eat uh, healthy things. And mm-hmm. when you think about some people out there um, have chosen to not eat meat anymore uh, because they, they have all kinds of reasons. Uh, mm-hmm. But one of the reasons uh, that is most talked about is how human beings have treated animals. And mm-hmm. so there's animal rights movement out there on on how could we be treating animals this way and 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 in order to make a statement, I'm going to stop eating meat. So you you may have may may or may not have heard of that. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't think one uh, you know needs to uh, it needs to um, uh, needs to go too far to look at how we treat animals may not be or how we even treat humans and other people of different races and color, we, we, we may not treat them the same as we treat everybody. And, um, and that, that difference when it comes to animal and raising animals for food Mm -hmm. is a problem. It's a problem because, um, one, you know, someone might look at that and say, that's not right, but it's a different problem when the, when it starts affecting um, everybody else around you. So for example, in yeah. farming, right? We we take up so much land just to yeah. just to make food. That's true. And and I guess, you know, the amount of outdoor pollution as well, kind of, you know, the ratio of that to the land required is a pretty risky bet then. Um right, right. Meeting demand. And then, and then yeah. And then if the animals got sick, what do you do with all the fecal matter? And um and you know from from the sick animals like do you do you plow them back into the soil mm, mm. right yeah and so if it's one or two chickens or a cow here and there not a big deal but if you multiply that across 
a an environment that that is already kind of sick. Uh, there's a lot of people, eight billion plus individuals on the planet, and nowhere else to push this stuff out. You might end up causing and triggering um, something downstream. And young onset, right? Rectal cancer, uh, mm -hmm. Yorks, right? YORCs. That that's if that starts showing up, which it now has been showing up in early and earlier uh, colorectal cancers. Now you say that's a different thing than animal rights. It, of course, of course it is, and I think you know we see that. Um, you know, some of the research that you shared with me just shows the link between the makeup of one's kind of microbiome um, and mm -hmm. the microorganisms in their digestive tracts um, that are, of course, you know, informed by, you know, the diet and use of antibiotics, et cetera, of that patient can absolutely increase cancer risk. So I guess, you know, to use Yorks as a kind of um, starting point, how then can we think about understanding, I suppose, the use of graphene in agricultural practices to potentially reduce these cancer risks and other sort of health related um yeah yeah i love that question you know the 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 issue comes with our standard for practice of growing food requires the sun it mm -hmm. requires lots of land it requires the sun to actually be shining like we have the sun but what about on um, on a rainy day, um, what about on a time when the moon's out? Well, the sun isn't out. Is, does it work? <laughs> and it doesn't work very efficiently for half the time. The the time when when the sun is going down all the way until the sun rises again mm. is inefficient. So so what happens when you have these inefficiencies or you have these sicknesses? Like you mentioned, antibiotics. Um, it's antibiotics isn't just for the ones who use the antibiotics. It's the one like what happens when a, a user of antibiotics goes to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. Now, now, now it's now it's in the sewage system. Um, the fragments are in the sewage system. Does it do the fragments still have um, efficacy? Mm -hmm. Certainly it has some efficacy until it all breaks down, right? And then, what happens if you have sick animals? Why do you treat them? you know, use antibiotics, right? So so then you have it in the the food and the growth. And and so the, with graphene, graphene is not just a 23rd century material. It is also a 23rd century inspiration of mm -hmm. how can we do something differently? Um, do we need, is there anything wrong with the sun, for example? Well, there is because the people, people farming are exposed to the sun and the sun is actually what you use for leathering. So if you ever need to turn um, animal skin into leather, you apply the sun. That's an age-old oh. methodology. Didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. So now we have to have sunscreen. What's sunscreen made of? Well, sunscreen's made of chemicals. So now we have to use more chemicals to address the problem. So we, we have problems on top of problems and solutions that add to problems. So graphene inspiration is to say, can we go and solve our problems without creating more problems. Mm. And can you, right. can you expand on that? So what is the, I guess, you know, explicit link? I, you shared a paper that sort of, you know, connected the significance and understanding, um, you know, applications and implications of graphene in these agricultural practices. But in practice, how does that actually work? Are they applied, you know, is graphene applied to soil? Um, what does, you know, can you please draw the picture of what um, that could look like? Yeah. So first of all, uh, I was not in the paper. So that's no, no, no. Of course, that, that way it's not <laughs> me saying, right? <laughs> that this, it's not me doing the research. And then I simply in in 2014 featured a piece of graphene on the big screen in TED, where I show that hey, you know, it's not just graphene. It's a graph, it's a certain type of matrix of graphene that can be so lightweight and functional, not just here's graphene, right? And in that functionality, what do you propose could be possible? And I shared possibilities of purifying things that have been poisoning us for a very, very long time, such as um, such as environmental toxins. 
And that's a big word. It covers everything from petroleum toxins, you know, oil spills and things like that, to heavy metals, cadmium from batteries, potentially mm -hmm. lithium in the future as we have more uh, electrification, right? Yeah. Uh, uranium as we have more spillage. But also, what about cleaning up the antibiotics? What about cleaning up? Um, so how do you clean up the antibiotics? One is to is to almost like a magnet att attracted. Is that one form? That it could be one form, but another form is the reduction in the usage because graphene has antibacterial and antiseptic capabilities. Mm. Wow. So a soil matrix that let's say um, we, you and I both know that there are good bacteria yeah, and there's bad bacteria, right? Of course. And why do we brush our teeth? We brush our teeth because we want to make sure our mouths are clean after we eat, right? Um, although most people after eating don't brush their teeth. The majority of people brush their teeth before they go to bed mm -hmm. and when they wake up before they eat. Yeah. Which is a really, um, you say, well, why, why is that? I didn't eat anything between uh, waking up and it doesn't take food to cause the bacteria to grow. Mm -hmm. It takes the environment. Um Let's say you didn't floss and maybe there's some plaque and infrastructure for the bacteria to really grow out. So Thanks. graphene has the ability to prevent that environment from, from promoting the bad bacteria. How interesting. Yeah. Which There's of its properties that. allows it to do that? It's electronic properties. It, okay. Itself, it's just like the pie stacking the the you know the, the graphene in itself could do that so so no so there's two ways to do that either you add the graphene right into the growing medium which would be very direct but what if i grew the medium in the presence of graphene rods for example and now or 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 sheet material and then uh, graphene casing and then um and i pass through more electricity in there and um, I was able to blank out my soil. And now I just, I just, you know, removed the soil and the soil is now usable. Mm. Huh. I see. So yeah. I guess then um, one of the, one of the things that we sort of began discussing last time was this idea of like indoor horticulture and kind of, you know, individual, um, you know, agricultural practices. Um, and so, as you said, you could kind of, you know, use this as an additive in, as you know, in a growth medium. So is there any sort of micro effort that any individual can do to protect themselves from these harmful bacteria from growing in the food that they consume? First of all, the um, we, we need to know, we need to acknowledge that there are harmful bacteria. Um, there's always breakouts in the grocery store. Um, mm -hmm. The USDA uh, is always recalling something usually it has something to do with lettuce and e coli right yeah. we know we know that things aren't very good we also know that the sun is inefficient both in it's very it, it's it's inefficient in harming us so if we went out you know during the morning hours it's probably better than going in direct sunlight during noon right where the sun is right overhead and and beating on you um but then the efficiency of the sun is probably best between 11 and 1 p.m. And then after that or before that, it's not as efficient. So if we could find a way to grow our food in the home, inside mm -hmm. of residences, one is the the amount of oxygen plants give off. That's good for us. Yeah. Right? That's really good. Sick building syndrome and other things. But then also... What if we could optimize? Now, remember, this is graphene inspiration as opposed to you know, just directly using graphene. So we're going to now create the optimization of 11 to 1 p.m. sun um, on the plants at 5 p.m. or 8 p.m. at night. So hmm. now our plants grow 300% faster. I sent you some photos of those plants, right? So yes, you can see yes. that I put the seeds in there during like right like on December 24th. So that's, uh, you know, that's when I put them in there. And from germination all the way to the size of the lettuce that you saw, um, that happened within two weeks. Okay, that's amazing. Yeah. 
right? So why is that happening? One is the conditions are right. You change the amount of sunlight they're going to get. But then also the soil medium is going to be optimized so that you're not starting off with a rough patch. You're not starting off with terrible bacteria around you and you're, you know, the seedling is struggling to survive. Now, inside the home, you know, indoor growing will prevent birds from pecking, taking the seed and saying, oh, that's food, right? So, mm -hmm. or, or you won't have certain organisms, not just bacteria and germs, but bigger things like nematodes or, or, or parasites crawling in, you'd make sure that, that the soil doesn't contain any, the growing medium doesn't contain any of that stuff. And then you say, can the growing medium contain recycled things, you know, from, from, uh, from plant matter and other things like that. And you start looking at those, those um, uh, filters in front so that you, you add in all those components. So now, now you take and say, why, why is it so powerful? Someone who's suffering from cancer is going to be able to have freshly grown food, like freshly grown, meaning wow. when they clip yeah. it right off, they can eat it right away. Mm -hmm. right? As opposed to store-bought, right? Store-bought store -bought is how long has it been there? <laughs> Many right. questions. You're right, right. Many questions. Your mind is now flowing. It's very different from anything you've ever had. And then you say, Wow. So you've got the life force, you've got those things. And then let's add in the AI from Harvard, right? Let's add in something here where, well, we're now going to flip it to eat in the even higher level is, should we really be eating so much lettuce? Right. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, um, if I gave you a choice between a grill, grilled chicken and, mm -hmm. um, and, and fried chicken, did, did you know that most people would choose fried chicken? Really? Yeah, yeah, statistically. So this is the the mathematics behind it, right? So it's like, wow, um, why why would you take fried chicken? Well, because fried chicken tastes better. You know, you you do a survey and you'll see that most people will choose that grilled chicken. Well, it could be dry, right? So what you could do though is to change. How do you make fried chicken healthier? Well, you fry it in oil that doesn't break down during the first frying, or at the temperatures you reach. It doesn't smoke right away. Imagine frying in olive oil. Olive oil breaks down. That would be terrible. And so, so well, you know, imagine you say, "Oh, I'm going to fry uh, chicken in olive oil." It breaks down, and so all the breakdown material is in the chicken now. So you, you, we have to consider under graphene inspiration the impact. Store bought food is just not as fresh as um as 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 farm picked. But you can't get farm picked unless you go to the farm. So that's that's like a lot of traveling, right? And then what we are interested in collecting under graphene inspired is what if we created a seed bank for people who have um, have complications in their health, right? Cancer is being one of them. But another one is let's say they're they're athletes and they want to have higher performance in their bodies. Did you know that kale actually has a lot more nutrients than lettuce? Did you know that? Did not, but actually, I guess, yeah, it was what was one you, of the right, trends right? a few but, years ago, yeah. Yeah, imagine going to, um, you were in New York, so imagine going for um, the, um, the Cobb salad, right? The Cobb salad, now you think of a Cobb salad, that's just going to be, hardcore lettuce with maybe, you know, some blue cheese and other things like that, but it's not going to contain microgreens. Mm -hmm. It's not going to contain, um, contain things like, um, rocket, which is, um, you know, yeah. in the UK, you guys call it rocket, right. Um, mm -hmm. but it's arugula in the United States. So, yeah. you know, you, you wouldn't have arugula with your, as a, so, so you imagine if you start looking at the data sets of arugula, growing arugula, and growing kale as opposed to having this graphene inspired system as a hobby. Like it's a hobby, it would yeah. be like, oh look, this stuff could grow. But as a as an inspiration, it would be, we don't do that. You know, we're we're looking for the data sets of how to make these things grow, grow well. And we want a, a community to be formed. Remember how yeah. when we started talking about, you know, when we started doing this podcasting, talked about the value 
of um, of explorers working together is first you have to have a community of us exploring. Otherwise, you know, we we are mainly a community on LinkedIn or other places of a community of of exploiting ourselves. In fact, we share with each other. Look, I just got exploited, meaning I just got hired by so and so, and I'm off to the races. I've been exploited for 20 years. I allowed myself to do that. You know? And you'd say, oh, where are you being exploited at? Oh, I'm being exploited at this so-and-so company and another company. Um, and why are you getting the degree? Because I believe this degree is really good for being exploited. Imagine if you like start substituting. It's kind of funny, right? Yeah. So, so I, I share with, imagine how we could now suddenly know about bowel habits of our user base. We would know, um, we might even know if they have rectal bleeding, you know, if, if these are York, York based individuals, young onset, uh, rectal cancer, you know, we would, we would know things and they would say, oh yeah, eating this kale because it's a higher fiber diet. Suddenly, um, not only did I lose some weight, but I also, um, gained some strength and I could do the mm -hmm. things I otherwise couldn't do community based support systems are really valuable. And then it's, you know, you get life force optimization too. What is that? It's eating foods that haven't gone through a bunch of middle people. Middle people could be fine, but sometimes middle people have to focus on profits and, and what could affect the profitability of our, of our food? Well, it spoils. So did you know that if I cut the shoots from the uh, the plants I just showed you, I cut them, they'll grow back. Actually, they're actually encouraged by you trimming them and cutting them to grow even more. I see. I see. Yeah. So yeah, no, of course, I think, you know, driving profits does, you know, compromise a lot of the, you know, intrinsic nutritional benefits. Because um, as you said, the ideal would be to, you know, just have it straight from the farm. But of course, that's not possible for most. Um, so it seems as though, you know, as we've been saying, like a lot of the indoor horticulture um, affected by, you know, the benefits of graphene could absolutely help be the first step in tackling um, this, you know, I would call it like a food crisis that we find ourselves in um, in the century. And I think um, we've outlined a lot of the benefits of graphene, but now that we're sort of ending, <laughs> ending the podcast, I'd love to hear, are there any risks to using graphene in soil? Or what do you perceive to be the sort of greatest um, mountain that we'd have to climb in implementing this um, for many people to benefit? Is there a food crisis for the general consumer right now? Uh, what they, as long as they have, they have the, um, the 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 desire to buy something and they have a, an impetus, they can basically buy anything they need to. Um, sure. But for someone with with cancer, right? they will not be able to buy these fresh vegetables. They're, 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 so the food crisis comes to them first. Um, and that's where solving graphene, uh, graphene solving those issues is, is very powerful because it's not solving the food crisis for everyone because to many, there's no crisis. There's no, there's no issues. But for those suffering from, from cancer, um, they may not do as well eating store-bought food that has been sitting there for a while. In fact, they actually can't study those differences. This is largely unavailable. Of course. And then I guess, you know, it's just, it's not even as a sort of, you know, remedy towards these illnesses, um, but as a preventative measure. I mean, you, food is, you know, the greatest medicine um, that's out there really. And I think that um, for any individual that's trying to improve their health, having access to the most natural and um you know as we said like full of nutrients sorts of vegetables that they can access would be um would, yeah be of mass benefit and would save you know especially here in the uk where we have a national health service it would save the nhs you know millions and millions um in preventative um measures i'd say yeah and then and then and then if i wanted to um to avoid pesticides or i wanted to improve the air quality in my home or my living space, um, <clears throat> using, using, um, creating an, an ecosystem like that with um, what I describe as pea soil and also pea pods. It's um, you know, it's not just growing for for a hobby or 
or look, I can grow, I can grow, I can grow corn in my house. You know, that's not really, um, that's not really what the purpose of the graphene inspiration is about. It's to, it's to look at the data coming in and having a community of individuals sharing that data around, is your health improving under um, those growing conditions instead of growing flowers in the background or, or, or plants? Um, how is that oxygen content and how is that doing psychologically for you where you're not having to go out there and, um, and, 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 and grow this because you, you like plants or let's say, you know, um, what, what if you had a different impetus and what if we could start showing that this could be possible? Imagine the scalability as we run into what you were describing earlier. What if the pollution were to go get 10 times worse in the next 10 years? What if we had um, we had flooding, more flooding issues so that now the sewage um, system gets into our farming water, right? Our growing waters. Um, you know, having in, investing in an area like this using graphene inspiration um, and looking at 23rd century potential problems and taking those solutions that we'd have 200 years from now and applying them today. Oh, better, better food sourcing, uh, you know, a total elimination of pesticides, creating data sets around communities so that we have more an increasingly high level, high quality level of data sets around kale, as mm. opposed to let's just grow any vegetable. See that seed banking around those high quality vegetables suddenly creates a very different community. I mean, imagine if Facebook wasn't, you know, just very general. Imagine if it was extremely focused on if you if you do these things, what kind of conditions have you run into that have given you problems? Then we would solve those problems. I mean, how many types of pea soil are there? Mm -hmm. Right now we know three, but there could be 3,000 types. Um, and we may find out that like I sent you the paper on this, is that growing uh, all the way towards um, large-scale agriculture may benefit by having in-home growing. Because by having in-home growing, we'd, we'd optimize the lights. What happens if the plants are flowering? Or let's say you're growing cauliflower and you want to swap that out for, for, um, for chard or collard greens. Mm. Well, they have different heights. Is a growing system, can a growing system be designed so it's modular so that if I'm growing, if my cauliflower is getting to a certain size or weight, I can move it to a different location in the growing, in the growing sphere or system so that it, it's more efficient and, and we're constantly collecting that data. Imagine a, a platform like that, that has the backbone of a Facebook. That would be that would be huge. It would have such widespread effects, I believe. Um, yeah. <laughs> and and Dr. Chu, I guess, um, you know, our time is sort of running out. And as always, it is so amazing to explore with you. And today we looked over um, graphene inspiration in agricultural practices. And I was wondering if there was anything else you'd like to add uh, before yes. we wrap up for today. One last thing is um, how have we been doing this without graphene inspiration? We've been eating organic. That's what we have, right? We yes. buy organic from the store. We do. The cost of eating organic is expensive. Is it solvable? It's not. So we're just running away from the problem. Graphene inspiration has the chance of changing it for everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and with that, Dr. Chu, thank you so much for your time again today. And I look forward to continuing to explore with you next time. Yes, look forward to exploring further. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for listening to another episode of Calling All Explorers. To find out more, please visit fingra.com. That is P-H-E-N-E-G-R-A dot com. Thank you.